Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight. I'm Brandis Friedman. And I'm Paris Schutz. On the show tonight. So we can't let the stunts derail us from what the residents want us to do. One on one with Mayor Lori Lightfoot about the spike in summer violence, city council breakdowns and much more. This is a generational investment. We talk to lawmakers about President Biden's push for massive infrastructure investments. The renowned Chicago sculptor Richard Hunt and his years in the making new monument to crusading journalist Ida B. Wells in Bronzeville. And I read an article about big city reporters and anchors and I thought, wait a minute, I could do this. And he did. After nearly three decades, Phil Ponce ends his regular appearances on Chicago Tonight, a reflection on his career in journalism. But first, some of today's top stories. Illinois' financial outlook is much brighter today, according to Moody's Investor Service, which gave the state its first bond rating upgrade in more than 20 years. It came as welcome news to Governor J.B. Pritzker. This monumental development from Moody's Investor Service recognizes the depth of our efforts to reverse the damage of the past. With this ratings upgrade, Illinois is poised to save millions of taxpayer dollars after weathering a once-in-a-generation financial storm caused by COVID-19 and the pandemic. Moody's cited fiscal improvements such as constrained use of federal aid, increased pension payments, and keeping the state's bill backlog in check for the ratings increase. Travelers coming to Chicago from other states will no longer have to follow a travel order which required a quarantine or negative COVID test upon arrival. City health officials announced the transition today from a travel order to an advisory since none of the 50 states are recording more than 15 new cases per day per 100,000 residents. The order was suspended at the beginning of the month and can be reinstated if significant surges are seen in any state. And the city's test positivity rate has been down to half a percent for the past week. Chicago Public Health Commissioner Dr. Allison Arbody says that's an all-time low since the start of the pandemic, but people who are not vaccinated still need to be extra careful. Please, if you're going to travel, get vaccinated. Uh, it worries me when people are not fully vaccinated and they're traveling where we are seeing some surging, um, but there is no requirement around that. If you've traveled um, and you're not vaccinated, uh, please do wear a mask when you're back. Uh, you've got to wear a mask all the time if you're, if you're, if you're unvaccinated, but that would be particularly true um, if, if you've potentially traveled. And United Airlines is betting big that travelers will return to the skies by placing one of the largest orders ever for commercial planes. The Chicago-based company is buying 200 Boeing MAX jets and 70 planes from Europe's Airbus. The plan is to replace many of its smaller planes and some of its oldest. It is the biggest order in United's history and the biggest by any U.S. carrier since 2011. United CEO Scott Kirby predicts that business travel will pick up after Labor Day and that business and international travel will fully recover, but not likely until 2023. And now to Phil Ponce for a one-on-one -on -one with Chicago's mayor, Phil. Brandon, Chicago is in the midst of a violent summer as shootings go up and homicides match last year's year-to-date total. Meanwhile, Lakeshore Drive gets a new name and a push continues to create an elected civilian oversight board for the police department. Joining us to discuss all this and more is Chicago Mayor Lori Lightfoot. Mayor, welcome back to Chicago tonight. We very much appreciate your being with us. It's my pleasure and an honor to be on this broadcast with you, Phil. Oh, thank you. Uh, you and the city have had a rough couple of weeks. How are you holding up? Well, look, the truth is we've had a rough 15, 16 months. Um, we've had um, the challenge of uh, the, the global pandemic, which is um, still with us, um, although starting to recede into the background as a result of our huge push um, on an equitable vaccine distribution. Um, so that's all good. Um, we're starting to see our economy um, start to rebound. Um, but just like in New York, in LA, um, uh, San Francisco, um, Washington, DC, Atlanta, all the major cities across the country continue to be plagued with, I think, a, a pandemic spurred um, surge in violence. We are making progress, as you alluded to, um, but we still have a long way to go in making sure that residents all over the city are in fact safe. 
Mayor, uh, this past weekend was particularly troubling. troubling. Seven people are dead. Uh, overall, there were two mass shootings. Uh, aldermen are now calling, some aldermen are now calling for a special city council meeting with the police superintendent to discuss what's going on in the streets. Uh, is that a good idea? Look, I, I think the, the aldermen have an important role to play in oversight. But what I would say is the police department does regular briefings with aldermen, certainly with members of the public safety committee. Unfortunately, we need to make sure that all those aldermen are actually coming and participating in those briefings. But transparency around public safety is absolutely critically important. Mayor, you alluded to the fact that uh, other cities are also plagued with violence, but specifically in Chicago, what is not working? Well, I think it's a couple of things. Um, number one, I believe that violence is a manifestation of um, systemic problems, um, and it's a public health uh, crisis. When you see in way too many neighborhoods a lack of jobs, a lack of investment, and these are historic decades-long problems, they manifest themselves um, in an eruption of violence. The other thing that I, th I think is unique uh, to Chicago is we are surrounded by jurisdictions, both um, sister states, but also suburbs that have very lax gun laws. One of the reasons why I've been calling since 2019 for the federal government to step up and empower ATF, and finally we have a president who's listened is because we know that gun, uh, federally licensed gun dealers are selling to criminals and they're selling to straw purchasers, people who don't intend to possess these firearms. We know that uh, because of our proximity to states like Indiana, Wisconsin, and Michigan, that um, you can go across the border into these states and if you've got the, the cash, you can buy literally military grade weapons um, at any, uh, of any quantity and bring them back to Chicago. We also know that there's a consistent gun trafficking uh, problem from southern states to cities like Chicago. So the federal government is really uniquely qualified to address these issues. And I'm grateful that President Biden has heard what me and other mayors across the country have said is the federal government has to step up. We are awash in illegal firearms. The other piece of this, though, we have way too many guns, but we have way too few levels of accountability. The county courts have to open back up and hold these um, gun offenders and violent people accountable. We have not had the county courts open for criminal prosecutions and trials since March of 2020. As you, know, uh, as you know, Chief Judge Evans has uh, disputed that, saying that notwithstanding uh, some, of the, uh, some of the steps that needed to be taken because of the pandemic, that the process continues. But let me move on to something else, and that is... But, but, wait, but let me, before you move off on that, that's just simply not true. Justice delayed is justice denied. And if the criminal courts aren't open and holding people accountable, as of late April, for example, there were 99 people charged with murder who are out on bail on electronic monitoring. Those are not make those people out in the community after they've been charged with, with murder, they're not making our community safer. So every part of the public safety system, including the court, has to step up and do its part. Mayor, uh, last week's uh, city council meeting uh, famously or infamously ended unexpectedly. You appear to have very strained relationships with some aldermen. Uh, how would you describe your relationship with the city council right now? Well, look, I think that we have very strong relationships with a good working majority of the aldermen, but, but procedurally, two people can shut down the entire process. And unfortunately, historically, that has been used very sparingly, but we're seeing it being used more by people who, frankly, want to turn the legislative process into some kind of uh, stage performance rather than doing the work of the people. Given all the challenges that we're facing in the city, um, where people's lives are literally depending upon the work that we do as a mayor and as a city council. We need to be focused on doing the people's business and not political stunts. And unfortunately, there's a small handful um, that are um, not about the people's business. What they care about is getting themselves in the press. They care about disrupting the business of government. And we've just got to continue to fight against that and get things done. So despite the fact 
that Wednesday's meeting was disrupted. We resumed on Friday and we got two very important measures passed. One guaranteeing uh, the right to return to work for hotel workers and the second answering the cries of our small business people. Now we didn't get everything passed on small business and we'll be back at it again, but we took important steps to be responsive to small business people. So we can't let the stunts derail us from what the residents want us to do, which is to be responsive, listen to what their concerns are and make government more responsive and more of a, a friend to the residents of our city, cut through bureaucracy. And that's what we're gonna continue to be focused on. Mayor, when you ran, you said you supported a civilian board overseeing the uh, police department. Uh, your critics say that now uh, the latest proposal has no such civilian, uh, real civilian oversight over the police. Just how much civilian oversight do you want? Well, I, I was one of the first people um, in the city through the police accountability task force to talk about civilian oversight. I still support it. But obviously we've got to have checks and balances. What I don't support is a proposal supported by some, which is a backdoor way to defund the police. I don't support that. At a time when we're seeing this surge in violence, uh, the last thing that we should be talking about is defunding the police. And unfortunately, that's exactly what the proponents of one measure want to do. They want to take away the city council's accountability. They want to uh, take away the mayor's accountability, and they want to give it to the hands of a small group of civilians who clearly, if you look at who the people are supporting this, they are the defunding the police crowd. I don't support that. That doesn't make sense to me. Mayor, in recent months, uh, there have been questions raised about your, your temperament and uh, your reaction to criticism. Uh, Tribune editorial used the term irascible. Uh, how much of this do you think might have to do with the fact that you're a woman and specifically a black woman? About 99% of it. Expand on that. Well, I mean, look, look at my predecessors. Um, did, did people say that Rich Daly um, held, uh, you know, uh, uh, tea sessions uh, with people that he didn't disagree on? Uh, Ron Emanuel was a polite um, guy who was a, a uniter? No. Women and people of color are always held to a different standard. I understand that. I've known that my whole life. And the Tribune or whoever can write what they want. What I'm doing is fighting for the residents of the city. I'm an advocate. I'm going to continue fighting. Um, obviously, we need to be focused on uniting people as much as we can. But I, I was elected and ran on disrupting the status quo. And when you disrupt the status quo, you are gonna make um, people uncomfortable. You are gonna have people criticize you. But I know where my North Star is. I know the things that we need to be working on. Can I do things differently and better? Of course, life is a, a, a lifelong learning um, experience, I hope, for me and for others. But I uh, absolutely understand that the critics, some of them who are out there, are criticizing me because they don't like to see a woman assume power and, and forge ahead on an agenda that is about disrupting the status quo. Um, and look, I also say with the Tribune, consider the source. This criticism comes just about a month or so after I made a pointed decision at my two year anniversary that I was only gonna give interviews uh, for that two year anniversary to journalists of color. And it was like the sky was falling on the part of some of the folks that are embodiments of the status quo, including um, some of the media folks. But look around, look at that Tribune editorial board, look at the editorial boards of most of the uh, big media companies here in the city. They do not reflect our diversity. And many of the people on those boards don't even live in Chicago. So I'm sorry if I offend people by fighting for what people elected me to do, which is disrupt the machine, disrupt the status quo, and make city government more responsive to the residents. Mayor Lightfoot, that's where we'll have to leave it. Our many thanks to you for appearing on this program, and my personal thanks to you for coming on uh, over the years. So Phil, before we leave, you're gonna be missed. So I made this little cutout for you to say, Phil, please don't go. But even if you have to go, you're close to my heart. <laughs> Mayor, I don't know what to say, although I will say that bears a striking, striking resemblance to me. Mayor, thank you so much. That's very funny. Pleasure. Oh, my goodness.
and now to Paris with local members of Congress. Paris. Thank you, Phil. You are indeed a cut above. President Joe Biden was in Wisconsin today to sell the infrastructure plan and bipartisanship. Take a look. This is a generational investment, a generational investment to modernize our infrastructure, creating millions of good paying jobs. And here to talk about the infrastructure deal and more are Congresswoman Jan Schakowsky, a Democrat from Evanston, and Congressman Raja Krishnamurthy, a Democrat from Schaumburg. We invited every Republican member of the Illinois congressional delegation and some from surrounding states. None accepted our invitation, but we do thank you two for being back here and joining us. Uh, first to you, Congresswoman Schakowsky. Uh, the president is touting a pared-down $1 trillion infrastructure proposal that he negotiated with a bipartisan group of senators. It does not not include the child care spending, climate provisions, and higher corporate taxes that he and most Democrats wanted. Uh, so would this pared down bill have your vote? Well, what Nancy Pelosi has said, the Speaker of the House, is that a bipartisan bill, yes, we want to support that. But when it comes back to the House of Representatives, we also have want to have a commitment um, to a, another piece of legislation that we vote on um, in, uh, th that we vote 50 votes in the Senate uh, and then pass it in the House. A reconciliation bill, we call that, that would have all those other things in it. And we would not expect that we're going to get Republican votes on that. And, and as you said, Congressman, uh, Speaker Pelosi said, quote, there ain't going to be an infrastructure bill unless we have the reconciliation bill that you mentioned passed by the United States Senate. Uh, Congressman Krishnamoorthy, is that your position that you wouldn't vote for this infrastructure bill unless that other spending package is passed through reconciliation on a party line vote? I'd like to see that other package depending on what ends up being in the infrastructure package. But I think that the president uh, recently said that he would like to see the infrastructure package pass on a bipartisan vote, uh, this first piece. And, um, you know, I think that that's really important because our infrastructure needs are so dire, especially in a place like Illinois. And we need to get that done ASAP. Uh, and as you know, in Washington, uh, something like this, which is a multi-year package, cannot endure unless it is bipartisan. And so first we need to do that. Uh, but I very much want to do those other pieces as well. And if reconciliation is needed, then that's what we need ASAP too. Congresswoman Schakowsky, if se the Senate passes that other piece with the child care, uh, climate change, uh, tax provisions on reconciliation, does it risk some of the Republican support that has been pledged to this infrastructure bill? No, I don't think so. I think that the Republicans as well as the Democrats understand what, uh, uh, Mr. what uh, Congressman Christian Murphy said is a dire need in the United States of America. They're um, certainly wanting to go to the ribbon cuttings that um, repair their streets and um, their uh, all of the infrastructure in their communities. And um, we need those. We need to make sure that our bridges are not going to be collapsing. And actually, we had one collapse in the Washington, D.C. area recently. Um, and so we need to, as Republicans and Democrats, stick together on making this happen. A pedestrian bridge that, that recently collapsed, you're referring to in Washington, D.C. Congressman Krishnamurthy, what shovel-ready projects are in your district or in the Chicago area that are ready to go if this bill does pass? Well, I, I don't know if you have enough time for me to go through all those projects. A couple projects of big ones. <laughs> <laughs> in, in five seconds or less, uh, we have a number of projects around the Elgin O'Hare Expressway, which neither reaches Elgin nor O'Hare, Paris. Uh, and so uh, that is a, a big priority for the west and northwest suburbs. And I can't wait for this infrastructure, infrastructure package deal to go through so we can uh, finally get this aspirationally named expressway to both of its endpoints. Sounded like uh, Mike Myers on Saturday Night Live for, for a second there. Uh, Congresswoman Schakowsky, I want to transition to another topic. Uh, Speaker Pelosi has talked about putting together a select commission to investigate everything that happened uh, January 6th. The Speaker will pick eight appointees. Should she put a Republican like your colleague Adam Kinziger on a panel like that? 
I think that it should be bipartisan. I hope that uh, Kevin McCarthy, the Republican leader, will agree to participate fully in doing this. Um, you know, they rejected the idea of a full commission like we had for 9-11. Um, and so instead, what the speaker has said, we have to get to the bottom of this. And so we're going to have a select committee. And I think it's a good idea for it to be bipartisan. And my guess is that the speaker may even make it so if the Republican leadership decides not to participate. We need all voices um, to take a look at what really happened that day. People are still in trauma because of what happened that day and deserve to know what was really going on. And, and Congressman Krishnamoorthy, as it stands now, the House Republican leader, Kevin McCarthy, would be able to appoint five members should he choose to participate in this, which is an open question. Do you believe that any findings from this commission would hold more gravitas with the American people if there were at least some Republican voices on there, like Congressman Adam uh, Kinzinger or Liz Cheney? Yeah, look, I think that Liz Cheney or Adam Kinzinger or anybody who wants to get at the truth, Paris, um, would make uh, very good participants and um, members of this commission. The American people just want to know the truth of what happened on January 6th. They want to know about the truth of what happened leading up to it, uh, why the federal response was so delayed after urgent appeals for assistance, and why today so few people have actually been brought to justice in connection with January 6th. So whether it's Adam Kinzinger, Liz Cheney, or anyone else among the Republicans uh, who are interested in finding out the truth, they're going to have uh, a number of Democrats, I'm confident, who will uh, want to do the same. And, and that's what the American people want, too. And, and you have the former president uh, furthering uh, falsehoods that in some way the election was stolen, which did spur a lot of folks on the action. And, and Congresswoman Schakowsky, you had former Attorney General Bill Barr come out and, and call all those claims of uh, a stolen election BS, uh, in short. Uh, does that help sort of move the nation, heal the nation uh, b beyond some of these partisan uh, divisions, uh, sort of given the lies that are out there? Well, I think it's important that the former Attorney General um, you know, talk about the reality um, uh, of what happened that day and to encourage the uh, an, investi an investigation. Um, that's after a lot of things he did that actually supported Donald Trump and the big lies that, that he told. But, you know, we, we welcome that anyway, whenever, whenever it comes. I don't know if he's trying to... Um, do something for his reputation with his grandchildren, who knows. Um, but, uh, you know, he said what he said. And last question for you, Congressman uh, Chris Morthy. We only have a few seconds left, but obviously violence is, is again, a big topic in Chicago. President Biden uh, announced uh, cracking down, uh, enforcing gun laws. Is there anything new here uh, that the president or Congress is doing to combat violence in cities? Well, first of all, we need legislation to be passed by Congress to really deal with this issue. And in the House, we've done a lot in that regard with regard to universal background checks and so forth. But unfortunately, it's stalled in the Senate. All that being said, I think the president is doing the right thing in devoting more resources to prosecuting, for instance, gun shops that sell these uh, illegal guns. Um, and as you know, a disproportionate share of violence is commi committed by these um, illegal guns. And so uh, doing whatever we can to get those off the street is a start, uh, even as we uh, try to search for a more permanent solution to this gun violence epidemic through legislation in Washington, D.C. All right, we're going to have to leave it there. Our thanks, as always, to Representatives Jan Schakowsky and Raja Krishnamoorthy. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And up next, a look at a new monument for Ida B. Wells. So please stay with us. It really is about community where we all come together. Chicago needs to make space for everyone. And still to come on the program, on his last day of regular appearances on Chicago Tonight, we sit down with Phil Ponce to hear his reflections on his storied career. But first, when planning a new monument for the city, 
why not hire a local artist whose reputation is monumental? Sculptor Richard Hunt was born in Inglewood in 1935. His works have been exported around the world from his studio right here in Chicago. Producer Mark Vitale caught up with him before the unveiling of a monument in Bronzeville that was years in the making. Fifty years ago, this one-time electrical substation near DePaul was converted into a sculptor's laboratory. Richard Hunt has been grinding, welding, and creating here since 1971. When I got this place in the beginning, they had taken out all of the equipment except the crane, which of course I'm glad they didn't take it out. So here you have this big high ceiling open space, you know, to develop things in and move them around with the crane and get them out the back door. And... His process is intuitive. The way things work, I'll start you know, putting some things together that I have an idea about that'll suggest something. Some of his 21st century works are currently on the terrace of the modern wing of the Art Institute. Richard Hunt graduated from the School of the Art Institute in 1957 with a degree in art education, but... One year, you know, as I was working on my income tax, I, I said, you know, I made more money selling sculpture than I did from my teaching job. And so I, I decided I'd quit teaching and just be a sculptor. He has called his creations a dialogue between himself, the technique, and the material. It's dynamic and it's three-dimensional. I mean, that is to say, you, you're going to have a painting of something on the wall. There's something that you look at that doesn't change. But if you have a sculpture somewhere, you know, you, you look at it from here, you look at it from there, or you look at it from another side, and it reveals itself in different ways. He works with steel, bronze, copper, brass, and all kinds of scrap. Early in his career, he focused on found materials. In the 1960s, Studs Terkel asked him about it. Mr. Hunt, as we're looking at your various works, these two statues, these two works of sculpture in front of us, what's the material? How did this come to be? These were, what is the steel? Yes, well, the raw material for, for these are automobile bumpers. Richard Hunt's sculptures can be seen all over the city, from the Woodson Regional Library to Midway Airport to the Loop. His newest work in Chicago is Light of Truth, a monument in bronze to Ida B. Wells, the crusading journalist. A local author who is Ida B. Wells' great-granddaughter spent 13 years to bring to life this unconventional civic memorial. We made a decision before we even contacted Richard, that we wanted to have something that would not be in her likeness. We wanted it to be a monument versus a statue because Ida's life and her work was so multidimensional, so multi-layered that we felt trying to capture one pose would not necessarily capture all of who she was. The Ida B. Wells homes were right here on this land from 1941 to 2002. A tribute needed to be given to Ida on the land where the homes once stood, which is also really close to the house that she physically lived in. Um, and, and this is Bronzeville. This, this neighborhood has a strong, rich history. You know, I'm reminded of the past and, and then looking toward the future of this community. In the studio he's run for half a century, 85-year-old Richard Hunt is back to the grind. It's interesting how the cityscape has changed, and of course I, I, I'm happy that I've had a, you know, an opportunity to put a piece here and a piece there. It's been an important thing for me on many levels. For Chicago Tonight, this is Mark Vitale. The monument to Ida B. Wells is called Light of Truth, and it'll be dedicated at 10 a.m. tomorrow at 37th and Langley Boulevard in Bronzeville. Richard Hunt's work in the modern wing is up until September 20th. And make sure to watch our Chicago Stories documentary on Ida B. Wells and explore the companion website at WTTW.com slash Ida B. Wells. And now, Paris, back to you. Thanks, Brandis.
29 years ago, a seasoned reporter walked into WTTW studios and the rest is history. Tonight, Phil Ponce marks his final regular appearance with the program that he has led for much of the last three decades. In that time, the stories have changed, the political figures have changed, and journalism itself has changed. But Ponce and Chicago Tonight have been constant in carrying forward the intelligent public affairs news and analysis first conceived by the late, great John Calloway. Those are among the questions that we'll explore this evening right after this background report from a man we are pleased and proud to welcome as our new correspondent, Phil Ponce. With those words nearly 30 years ago, Chicago Tonight founder John Calloway introduced the man who would eventually become the face of news and public affairs at WTTW. The Chicago area has some of the most influential representatives in Congress and, not surprisingly, they want to keep their job. In that time, Ponce established himself as the city's premier television moderator and interviewer. Now a discussion of this Wisconsin plan led by the NewsHour's new national correspondent, Phil Ponce. But not before his work caught the attention of the PBS NewsHour in 1997, when legendary anchor Jim Lehrer hired Ponce as a correspondent and host. Thank you, Jim. Is Wisconsin a model for the rest of the nation? When John Calloway retired in 1999, there was little doubt who he would pass the torch to. As John was stepping away, the person he wanted to step into that place was Phil. And I don't think there is a higher compliment than that, frankly. Phil Ponce was born in McAllen, Texas, and raised in East Chicago, Indiana, the son of immigrant steel workers and one of nine kids. At Bishop Knoll Institute in Hammond, Ponce gravitated toward the arts, landing starring roles in productions of Bye Bye Birdie and The Music Man. He graduated with an English degree at Indiana University. He's pictured here with his now wife of 50 years, Anne. Ponce then got a law degree from the University of Michigan and embarked on a six-year career as an attorney. He always says, you know, he has nothing, no problem with being an attorney, but it just wasn't for him. But he wanted to find a career that involved a level of showmanship. Living in Indianapolis at the time, Ponce found a roundabout way to enter the television news business. He had a friend make a sort of a fake resume tape, wrote a little script, went to a production house, performed it on camera, submitted it to WRTV, and they said, you're hired. Ponce became a weekend reporter at WRTV in Indianapolis. Why do so many people hate cats? Why do they arouse such strong feelings? I think it goes back to mythology. And not long after, wound up in Chicago at Channel 2. He says what's especially significant about the day happened earlier. I know he loved his days as a street reporter for Channel 2, and he wouldn't take those years back, but it set him up to land at his true home at Channel 11, and that's where he really... I think connected with Chicago. Over the weekend, Chicago was the epicenter in a movement which appears to be growing. As Chicago Tonight host and moderator, Ponce built on Callaway's template of fair minded yet probing interviews, steering the debate on the issues of the day. So the first thing is he does his homework. Okay. And he does more homework. Anyone can come up with a list of questions. It's about the listening. That's what makes a good interview. And that's the hardest thing to do is to listen aggressively during an interview on live television. Every once in a while, those interviews could turn contentious. One of the interviews that is seared into my memory is when he pounded on the table on the set of Chicago Tonight. He goes, stop it. I'm an American too. I'm going to insist. I'm going to insist on civility in this discussion. Please, the four of you. All right, Shall we proceed? Shall we? Thank you. A crucial mission for Ponce and Chicago tonight, moderating candidate forums during election season. Because that is an absolute shameful thing to say. Not a, didn't lift a finger to investigate the biggest scandal in that Illinois history. That was a history. federal probe from the beginning. Every United not States attorney the feds has got involved, said it. Not after Every U.S. The attorney has involved. said it. And no matter no what your media gentlemen. meisters tell you, I'm not going to let you get away with that, right? I think it's failed leadership, Jim, no, and that's why you're ready for change. I think it's ready for Try going to work, Rod. I did when I, had, when I was sick. I went to work. Why don't you go to work? Why can't for you the pass record, one bill? Mr. Ryan, Mr. Bogoyevich, for television. the record, for the record, children, children dying, and I'm not going to let him get away with that. For the record, the U.S. Attorney... Not now, not never. Not for you and not for him. The U.S. Attorney was on our program, sitting right there, and he said, Mr. Bogoyevich, that what Mr. Ryan did 
in not pursuing investigation was completely the right thing to do, just for the record. What makes you different from the congressman and from Senator Trotter? Well, one of the things that we've talked about throughout this campaign is, is that I don't think there are a lot of ideological differences. I think all three of us are progressive urban Democrats. It was on Chicago Tonight that a young community organizer turned Southside state senator began to establish his bona fides as a serious political figure. There are people who have, uh, key people who have not given you an endorsement, Bobby Rush, John Stroger, uh, Carlos Collins. Your reaction? Well, look, the African American community isn't monolithic any more than the white community or the Latino community or the Asian community is, is monolithic. And then that state senator became a U.S. senator, surrounded by nonstop buzz about seeking even higher office. Speaking of the presidency, I'm looking at uh, a clip from something called sportsbook.com. I don't know if you heard about that, but they list your odds of being the next president as 30 to 1. Which puts you ahead of Florida Governor Jeb Bush. His odds are listed at 35 to 1, but you're behind Hillary Clinton yeah. at 6 to 1. Well, that's pretty one. good considering and I've ruled it out. <laughs> Another Illinois political figure, this one awash with rumors of corruption and poor fiscal management, found himself the unfortunate recipient of Ponce's tough and direct questioning. For the record, name one politically risky thing you've done so far as governor. One politically risky thing I've yes. done so far as mm -hmm. governor? Earlier in the year, you talked about the importance of testicular virility. Uh, shouldn't you use it to do something once and for all to fix uh, the funding uh, set up in Illinois? Well, I, I, I think we're making progress. This year's budget, what, sure changes the state's employee pension by uh, fund by more than a billion dollars. How big a mess are you leaving that other people are going to have to clean up? Um, we are, I think, in a position where our fiscal house is in order. Um, again, we've been able to do this in a way that no one thought we could possibly even have a chance sure, to do it. Sure, for now, but how about, how about your children? How about my children? What are they going to face in terms of you know, where this future debt is, uh, is going to put them? Well, let's talk about the, the issue of the pension payments. Without bluster or bravado, Ponce could corner political figures who weren't answering to his satisfaction by calmly following up with laser-like precision. Ponce refused to let the then Democratic candidate for governor, J.B. Pritzker, off the hook after a series of confusing answers about his personal fortune. Because the Tribune says at least 11 companies connected with you or family members have been set up within the past 10 years. Is that right? Not set up by me, no. Not at all. Not set up by you. Do you have any connection with them in terms of uh, uh, financial interests? Do you have financial interests connected with those 11 companies, at least 11 companies, the Tribune says have been set up in the past 10 years? No, those trusts are dedicated companies. to charitable. And, no, the, no, and the companies let, underlying, let, I guess, the trustees and the trust created those companies in order to make investments. That's what trusts do. But Ponce's legacy is far from limited to serious political coverage. He could also have some fun. John Cleese, you were very first tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was fun. <laughs> And you smell good too. Make the feels warm. <laughs> oh, can, can I use that as a theme show for Chicago Tonight? No. It's typically made out of tissue paper. And if that wasn't enough, Chicago Tonight documented Ponce's various hobbies that could sometimes turn into obsessions stained glass, Biking. bike riding, trumpets, <laughs> papel picado. Bead making. Bead making. But I think gardening is the one skill that trumps them Above all. Above all the others, gardening. He wants he to work in his yard. A maniac. All day long. Yes. Perhaps Ponce's proudest legacy, the fact that a viewer can flip through Chicago's TV channels and stand a good chance of landing on a different Ponce. Ponce, can you see by the dawn's early light? In 2014, the Ponce takeover of Chicago extended to America's national pastime when the three Ponce men collaborated to sing the national anthem on opening day for their beloved White Sox. The three of us uh, singing in unison there. And the rocket's red flare. Unforgettable. That was probably the most nervous I've ever been to sing. 
the end of this month, I will be making my last regular appearance on Chicago Tonight. Now, as Ponce transitions into a new role, taking on special assignments for Chicago Tonight, he passes the torch to a new generation, much like John Calloway did with him. Meanwhile, Phil and Ann will devote more time to successive generations of Ponce's, their three kids and five grandchildren. And oh. Quite a lot to choose from oh there, my Phil. Gosh, Quite my, a lot of highlights. My head is spinning from that. <laughs> but I, you, know, you, you did a beautiful job of uh, kind of uh, touching on the arc of a career. Well, Phil, what's, what's your initial reaction, reliving some of these moments and some of the moments that we've watched over the last week? I would say that I'm impressed by what you and I do in terms of the range of stories that we cover. And that's one of the... That's one of the fun things about this job. You know, we probably shouldn't tell people that this is a fun job to have. But to, to interview uh, prominent people like Barack Obama, who's coming up, interviewing people in the arts like John Cleese from, uh, uh, from, uh, from, from Britain and his wacky uh, comedy, and then artists that, uh, that you and I have admired, the range of people that we cover is, uh, is, is just a real treat to us. And our job is to make it interesting for viewers. It's a privilege to get to do that. And it's fun to go from a hard political segment to Elmo to, uh, to John Cleese or to a comedian or to a movie star. Um, Phil, you've been in this business for about 40 years, 30 years almost at public television. Was this the grand master plan <laughs> when you were conceiving your life? Your uh, career, Paris. Believe me, uh, there, there was no, uh, there was no master plan. There was a series of, of happy accidents. Uh, sometimes so, an opportunity comes to you that you were not expecting in any way, and it works out. Sometimes it doesn't. Happily, the time that I have spent here has been wonderful, inspiring. Uh, working with amazing colleagues like you. Well, I want to hear more about that fake audition tape that your sons were talking about in Indianapolis. <laughs> it wasn't really a fake audition tape. It, 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 what I did, it was, it was staged in the sense that I had no previous television experience. So what I did is I memorized, uh, I wrote and memorized a newscast since I didn't have a teleprompter to read off of. And I went into a production house and they, they, they did a videotape of me. I did one take and I thought, well, I'm not going to be any better than that. And so I did shop it to the different stations in town, and WRTV, which was uh, the ABC affiliate at, at the time, they hired me as a weekend reporter, and that's where everything started. It's an amazing way to break into the business, and of course you spent many years at WBBM Channel 2. You were out of the business for a while before you got the call to come here from John Calloway. How did that come about? I was working for, I was in, working for, uh, uh, for a communications company, Ameritech it was called at the time, and I was in corporate communi communications, and I was missing television news. And so I called John Calloway up, who I knew from, uh, from a fellowship program at the University of Chicago. And coincidentally, uh, they had an opening. So they had identified somebody else. Uh, she wound up not taking the job, and they hired me. And I will tell you, the day that I was hired here at Channel 2, I literally walked into the parking lot, jumped up, and clicked <laughs> my heels. I was so happy. I this was the land of Oz. <laughs> no, it was the land of Oz. I don't want to say I've clicked my heels every time I've left the station, but I'm telling you, working here has been just an honor and a privilege, and yes, it's been fun. Well, let's take a look at one of the uh, hard probing interviews uh, that we missed there. In 2004, during a senatorial debate, you asked then-candidate Blair Hall about some seedy allegations against him. Let's take a listen. Mr. Hall, your wife has accused you of striking her? threatening to kill her, and calling her a vile name. For the record, are those charges true or false? I think this has uh, captivated this entire campaign for the last 10 days, so I think it's important that we talk about this. Phil, as I wrote about, you have this second gear that you can go into if you sense you're not uh, being dealt with on the level by a newsmaker that you're interviewing, where you really home in, you, you really double down, uh, without ever changing your tone, always measured and even kill. Can you just tell me about your philosophy of interviewing in moments like that? I think you can always ask the toughest possible question. It's the matter of tone. And usually, and it takes pressure off the interviewer if you maintain 
sort of a consistency and not become prosecutorial, say. And it's easiest if you just uh, state the facts clearly and ask them to respond, even if the facts are difficult. And that has come up uh, a number of times, and I have found that a non-prosecutorial, calm tone, while asking a tough question, at least it works for me. Any interviews over the years that were particularly difficult or, or particularly made you sweat? Mm, <laughs> you know what? The interviews that make me sweat are the interviews, the times I've had to interview comedians. For me, comedians are so hard. I know this about you. <laughs> because they are like quicksilver. You never know where they're going to go. It's complete improvisation. It's complete improvisation, and it's not just a matter of yes and. No. It's a, it's a, ma it's a matter of sort of holding on to the, holding on to the saddle and hope the horse doesn't, <laughs> does, doesn't, uh, doesn't knock you off. Any particular comedian uh, that uh, comes to mind? Uh, I would say pretty much any comedian makes me nervous. Jeff Garland is, is, is better than, is, is easier to handle than many, but even with him, you just never knew where he was going to go. And you just have to be totally in the moment. And you can't prepare for comedians in the same way that you can prepare, uh, prepare for, a, for a politician. But you, you two had a good patois uh, between you when he was on. You gave him a tie uh, because he complimented your tie. Um, what about uh, President Obama? You saw him there when he was just a state senator and then a senator. When you first saw Obama, he came on to this program earlier, early in his career. Did you look at him and say, presidential material? I would say that, I, I don't know that the term presidential material came to mind, but I certainly thought this person, uh, this is a very bright person. He's poised, he's got this charisma, and uh, no, I didn't, I didn't immediately think he's going to be in the White House one day. But uh, after he was on the show 10 or 15 times, he was on our show a total of 20 times or so before he became president, I thought, yeah, this, this guy's going somewhere and it could be the White and, House. And what's it like watching that kind of ascension from your perch? Well, uh, it's, it's an incremental growth, uh, but a solid growth. You could see the, if, if you watch his appearances on Chicago Tonight, you can see the evolution of someone who continues to uh, who continues to grow in in maturity and poise? Although uh, I have to tell you the story. After I moderate, moderated a debate between uh, Barack Obama and Alan Keyes, uh, I posed the question of gay marriage to both of them, and um, Barack Obama I thought didn't handle it all that well. He kind of waffled, and then after the debate was over, I was talking to somebody, and I heard somebody, uh, one of his supporters, talk to Bar uh, say to Barack Obama. You were not ready for Phil Ponce. <laughs> you were not ready for Phil Ponce. And that's one of the highest compliments I've ever received. And as I understand, he asked you to get lunch uh, once many, many years ago, and that lunch date still hasn't happened. So well, maybe it's time to call him up. And <laughs> he and I uh, traded messages, phone messages, and finally I thought, oh, this is too much trouble. I'm, I'm not going to call him back. Who's this guy? Um, you know, you've witnessed so many things happen in Chicago, in the nation, in the world. 9-11, what was it like, and what do you remember about the show uh, that you did after 9-11? That was one of the toughest shows that we've ever done. I think all of us were, uh, we, we scrambled. I think at the time it was a half-hour show, uh, but we expanded it to an hour. We tried to react to it in a way that was uh, an attempt to get our heads around what had happened. But I, I will tell you that all of us were traumatized, and it was one of the toughest shows we've ever done because all of us, our, our feelings were our feelings were very very raw, and uh, I would say that uh, I would say that those of us who put that program together and you know met many Americans suffered from a type of PTSD after that. So yeah, it was tough. I'm looking at some of these uh, some of these clips of people I've interviewed, and I, I just want to thank all the guests who have graced us with their presence in difficult times like 9/11 or. Uh, or even in lighter times when we have um, when we have entertainers on, if this show did not have a, a cadre of guests, we could not do what we do. And people have been tremendously ge generous in sharing their expertise with us, and I thank them. We for certainly it. are appreciative of their time, especially when they had to come up to the studio here, and uh, that uh, has been sort of. Uh, off for the last 15 months with these Zoom interviews for the, because of the pandemic. Hopefully those come back. You mentioned some of the entertainers and celebrities, uh, Rita Moreno, um, Judy Collins. Anyone particularly fluster you because you were just so in awe of who they were? <laughs> well, I hate to say it, uh, you know, that I, I went into fanboy mode, but I have. But I remember some advice that Jim Lehrer gave me when I went to the news hour. He said, interview everybody the same, whether you're interviewing Jesus, Buddha, or Muhammad. 
not, I mean, think about it. If you were interviewing any one of those figures, you would, <laughs> you would be in awe. But the point that he was making is attempt to, every, to e interview everybody and in a similar way in the sense that you prepare, you listen, and you react. You don't want to get too fanboyish uh, or fangirlish. Otherwise, you, you know, you, it, it, it makes the audience uncomfortable. But I would say, heck yes, when uh, I think every, every man my age uh, probably had a crush on Judy Collins. When I sat across from Judy Collins, uh, I, I, have to, I have to admit my heart skipped a beat. Uh, same with Rita Moreno or with Geraldine Chaplin. Uh, I remember seeing her in Dr. Zhivago when she shows up in this amazing pink outfit at the train station, this famous scene. I don't know if you there remember. There it is, right there. There it is. Took my breath away when I saw that. And to meet her years later, you know, I was kind of dazzled. I'm human. Quickly, Phil, uh, I want to bring in Brandis Friedman here, but I, you've watched your sons, Dan and Anthony, follow in your footsteps. What has it been like uh, to watch that? I'll, I'll tell you, it has been uh, a source of amazement to me. I had no idea. It was not, it was not part, it was not part of, a, of, a, of a grand plan at all. I remember my son told me one story where he showed up at the scene of a, scene of a crime or something, and it was in Beverly, and he got out of his, uh, he got out of his minivan. This is Dan, and uh, he heard a neighbor say, oh, look. They sent a Ponce, you know, <laughs> as if we're fungible, uh, and <laughs> maybe we are. But no, I, it, it, is, it is gratifying, I, mostly because, you know, I feel that they have found something that they love. Same with my daughter, Maria, mm. who's an outstanding photographer. For parents to have children who are finding their way in the world and um, making a living and enjoying what they do, that is so... So satisfying. Well, Phil, I feel like a television son of yours. I walked in here 16 years ago as an intern, and I remember the supervisor walking me down the hall as the hall hallway grows longer and longer, and your office is looming large. I walk in, and there you are with a smile, and you couldn't have been friendlier and, and more gracious, and you've been like that for 16 years, and it's been a pleasure to learn from you and produce for you and then become a close co colleague of yours, and it's, it's been an honor for me, and I wouldn't be here without you. And I know that uh, Brandis Friedman, uh, my esteemed colleague, uh, has similar sentiments that she wants to express to you. Yeah, thank you, Paris. Uh, and, and, you know, to that end, when I first got hired here eight and almost a half years ago, I think I've lost count because it's been that great. Um, but when I was first hired here, Phil, you told me, you made a prediction that this would be the best television job I had ever had. And so far, you've still been right. Uh, that's something that I remembered. And I think, you know, part of the reason that that has held true um, is because of the, the culture of the newsroom, the journalism that we practice here. And you've obviously been extremely influential uh, in fostering all of that. Um, you know, a couple of things that, you know, not every Everybody knows about Phil Ponce. I, um, I wore my commemorative Phil Ponce necklace uh, today because everybody knows or everybody that works here knows is that Phil Ponce is a very generous person. Um, in addition to being very creative and talented, uh, and we know that that's apparent by everyone in his family, I always hoped, Phil, that if you and Anne adopted me, maybe <laughs> I would be creative and talented too. I don't think it's too late, especially since you're leaving. This way we'll get more quality time. Um, the other thing is, you know, you're, you're also very funny. I think uh, it's important for people to know that and very generous. I mean, you gave me a necklace for crying out loud, but, you know, today you gave some of us chocolate bars just for fun. Um, I think a number of us have had a meal either on you or at your home uh, over the time. I don't want to leave you with a bad taste in your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Which means you owe me a meal. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, Paris and I will do our best uh, to try and continue to make you proud. I'll leave you with a dad joke. Um, it takes two of us to fill your shoes. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, Phil, and of course, got I, it. <laughs> I wish you sunny days in the garden with the grandkids. Thank you, Brandis. Uh, Paris, I have to say that uh, one of the joys of this job is working with you. Uh, you know, I sometimes think of you as a son, and I'd be proud to have Brandis as a daughter. Uh, and uh, I'm so grateful for the colleagues I've had. I'm so grateful for the support that management has given the show and me. And uh, I already mentioned that without the guests, we'd be nothing. And without you, you viewers, we would be nothing. And it's been the honor of my lifetime to work here. It's been the honor of my lifetime to occasionally have people come up and tell me how much they, how much they enjoy the show and the work we do. And I am going to miss you very much. Happily, I would still come back uh, occasionally to do special assignments. But uh, I'm going to miss you. I'm going to miss this work. Uh, but... Uh, yeah, in, if, if there's the, in the phrase going, going, gone, 
I'm between going and gone, maybe closer to gone, uh, but uh, I, 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 I leave for now as a very happy and grateful person. And, and Phil, I mean, it's been a remarkable career, and as you said, it's not over, because you will be here, and uh, we, will, we will be thrilled to welcome you for special assignments and for guest hosting and for, for anything else that you'd like to come in here and do, because this place is always your home, and as I said, there's a Mount Rushmore Chicago tonight, John Calloway, Phil Ponce are the two faces on there right now. I think so. the other person are really Carol Murray. And Carol Murray. On that. Paris, I love you. All right, I love you too, Phil. And we're back to wrap things up. But first, we take a look at the weather. That is our show for this Tuesday night. Don't forget to stay connected with us by signing up for our daily briefing. And you can get Chicago Tonight streamed on Facebook, YouTube, and our website, wttw.com news. And you can also get the show via podcast and the PBS video app. And please join us tomorrow night live at 7. Chicago's minimum wage rises to $15 on July 1st. Our Spotlight Politics team will talk about that and much more. And exploring the complicated legal and political history that helped shape Chicago's lakefront. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Brandis Friedman. And I'm Paris Schutz. Thank you so much for watching. Stay healthy and safe. We love Phil Ponce. Good night. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, a personal injury law firm serving Chicago for 37 years.